Father, we just come to you in the name of Jesus. Lord, it's all about you. God, it's not about me. God, it's not about anyone else in this room. Lord, it's all about you. So, Lord, we just simply yield to you. God, even though we're in the time with you in your word, God, we want to be still and know that you are exactly who you say you are. And God, see in a, in a new, fresh light, Lord, that you are God. So, Father, we just still our hearts and we open our ears. God, we ask that you would anoint your word. God, that you would anoint your message. God, your messenger, Lord. And God, let God your word and your message come to your people, God, for your glory, God, through your power. Lord, take this vessel, God, and Lord, let me be clean inside and out, God. Let me be a vessel of righteousness, Lord. So, Father, we just bless you and honor you in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a verse, I'm not going to read it to you, I'm going to paraphrase it, but it's been going around a lot. I'm going I'm to empty my pockets, so, uh, and it's on purpose. Uh, mainly because I don't want them in my pockets, but also uh, maybe a little later in the in the service. But uh, there's a verse that's been kind of circulating. It's just been popping up here and there, and it's about forgetting those things of the past, and behold, God is doing something new. Now, when God says forget the things of the past, he doesn't mean lose sight of them. The fact of the matter is we rejoice in what God has done. Amen whether that's in our lives or through church history or whatever, we keep that in sight, but we don't live there. We don't camp there. God is doing something new. And I'm convinced, and and I just feel it in my spirit, that God is wanting to move in in such a fresh new way here. And We know God is on the move. But I mean in a revival style type of moving. And, and, and not just looking for a holy visitation, but a holy inhabitation, so to speak. And that's, and that's really how, how God has created us to, to be, what God's created us to, to the relationship God has created us to have and, and, and with Him is this intimate, deep relationship. And we were singing, you are worthy of it all. And we were, uh, day and night, night and day, let incense rise, let praise arise, let, let all these things arise. And to me, I get this picture of the tabernacle of David. And, and this was something that, that, that was on my heart when, when I was able to talk to, uh, and if I look angry, I'm not. I'm just kind of intense. Kind of got like a face like a bulldog, so things fold over. And anyway, uh, you know, I do have eyebrows. You can't see them, but I, I don't have hair. Uh, anywho, the tabernacle of David, uh, and, and I, I think it's Acts chapter 15, verse 16, or it's 16, 15, but uh, Paul has ended up uh, at, at, the, at the council in Jerusalem, and they're talking about all that God uh, has been doing. And, the, and some, of the, some of the Jewish believers were trying to put the law and the, and the requirements of the law on, on the Gentile believers, and Peter stands up and he talks about, you know, that's, that's not the case. We couldn't even keep the law. Our ancestors couldn't keep the law. And then James, inspired and moved of the Holy Spirit, begins to speak, and he begins to quote out of Amos chapter 9, and he says, I will rebuild the tabernacle of David which has fallen. And it goes on there, but uh, it just uh, reading that the other day, or a few weeks ago, has just stirred my heart in looking at that tabernacle of David. And that's not what we're going to talk about fully, but I just want to unload this, <laughs> if that's okay. The tabernacle of David was not anything fancy. In 1 Chronicles chapter 13, uh, the, the Ark of the Covenant had been captured under Saul, uh, King Saul's reign, and David wanted to go retrieve it, and he went, but he went about it to do it the wrong way. He went with an, a, 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 new, a new cart, with oxen, with guys to ride in the cart and stable the Ark of the Covenant. And when that oxen stumbled, when they got the, uh, 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 um, is it Aiken's threshing floor? Mine just went blank. Anyway, there's a threshing floor in there somewhere. And it stumbled. That ox stumbled and the cart shook and the, and the Ark of the Covenant moved and Uzzah stuck out his hand and God struck him dead. Why? Because it was an improper way to handle that which was holy. 
David, in fear and in reverence and a little bit upset, left the ark, Obed-Edom's house, and it was there three months. And then finally, as you get into uh, 1 Corinthians, uh, uh, excuse me, 1 Chronicles 15 and 16, he goes and properly receives, uh, retrieves the Ark of the Covenant upon the Levite's shoulders. It's carried in. There's sacrifices and there's things that are made. And he brings the Ark of the Covenant. And that Ark of the Covenant is, is, is where the presence of the Lord, uh, Brother Kevin shared last week talking about the mercy seat. That mercy seat was upon the Ark of the Covenant. It was, it was the presence of the living God upon that seat. And that's what was important about the Ark of the Covenant. And David went and retrieved this. And he brings it to Jerusalem. And it says, and David pitched a tent there. Now you think, well, tent, in some places it says tabernacle, but the actual tabernacle of Moses was in Gibeon at the time. And here David went and retrieved, so to speak, the presence of the Lord, and he wanted it to be near where he was at. He didn't do anything fancy. All it says is he pitched a tent for it. And David began to, to lay out this 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 continual worship and when I think about the tabernacle of David what I think about is just two things intimacy with God and worship intimacy with God and worship guys the Lord is longing for that to be us the reason Jesus came to that cross and bore our sins and that veil was torn from top to bottom is that we could be the tabernacle of David. That the presence of the living God would dwell in us and there would be a place of intimacy and worship that springs out of us and flows through us. And I believe God is wanting to do that today on a deeper level in us as individuals as well as a church body. Hallelujah. As well as the global body of Christ. I might get a little excited. might start spitting. Y'all might had to start ducking. You said 1.30, right? Okay. Uh, I'm still old school. I'm, I'm, I'm a little high tech. I don't have a notepad, but I don't have an iPad. So we print that out. Uh, and y'all just hoping I find the landing pad when it's time, right? But we're still talking about set apart. There's an improper and a proper way. There's an improper and a proper way. To live for the Lord. To represent him in the earth. You being the temple of the Holy Spirit. As a believer, you, that's what the word says, does it not? Didn't Paul write that in 1 Corinthians? I believe it's chapter 6. Do you not know that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit and that you're not your own? In other words, do you not realize that the presence of the living God dwells in you? And as such, there's a call to holiness. There's a call to holiness. As an IPHC church, sometimes we focus on the P, the Pentecostal. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. Y'all got real quiet. Don't sound Pentecostal here at the moment. Like, where's this guy going? Uh, I don't know. So we'll just, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but there's an H in there that's for holiness. God has called his people, not just in the IPHC, but his people to holiness. Not in a legalistic sense, but because he's holy. Peter echoes in 1 Peter 1 that we're called to be holy because God's holy. You see, there's a proper way in an improper way. We can call ourselves believers, but if we're living like the world and we're not set apart, then there's a temple defiled. 
there's a temple defiled. Because when those things that are not of God are allowed to freely and willfully invade our hearts and be invited into our lives and put into practice, there's a defilement of the temple of the living God. And we are called to holy and righteous living. Now, praise be unto God, I don't have to achieve that in and of my own strength because I don't have it. But the Holy Spirit... What, what was that first word? Holy Spirit dwells in me, dwells in you. If you've been born again, the Holy Spirit dwells in you, and the reason he dwells in you is to make you holy. Jesus is holy. Scripture says in 1 Thessalonians, I want to say it's chapter 4, I may, it may be chapter 2, but he says the, the, the will of God for your life is your sanctification, your Christ-likeness, your being set apart from this world, being changed and transformed and worked into looking like the image of Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. Hallelujah. God is doing a work in his people and has called us to holy in righteous living. Now the problem with not having a notepad, I don't know where I'm at. Anyway, <laughs> Genesis chapter 15, and whoever's on, on those slides, God bless you, because uh, we're rolling with it. Is it in there? All right. Now let me, let me, let me set this up for you, because I didn't want to read the whole chapter. For your sake and mine. Start getting into names. I don't want to be repeating, uh, especially improperly. But the Lord speaks to, I'm just going to say Abraham. I know it's Abram at the time, but just, just so, the, so, so we're clicking on who we're talking about. Speaks to him and, and begins to tell him again about his inheritance because Abraham has expressed the fact that he has no heir. And that the one who's going to inherit his house is, is a servant. And the Lord says, no, 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 no. You will have a child of your own flesh and blood. I'm, again, I'm paraphrasing, so please don't, you know, cast stones. Uh, if you come with a stone, I'll quote scripture to you. Uh, might be paraphrased. Uh, no, I'm just gonna, <laughs> but uh, anyway. Uh, and... Uh, he, the Lord begins to say that his descendants, Abraham's descendants, were going to be like, like the stars in the sky. And Abraham says, Lord, how do I know this? And he says, go get me a bull, a ram, and a goat, each three years old, and a dove, and a pigeon. And Abraham cuts the bull, the goat, and the ram in half. And he separates their parts. So like the hind parts here, the front part there of each animal. And the dove and the pigeon, he didn't cut in half, but he separated them. And it begins to become dark. And this is kind of where we're at. And the birds of prey are coming down. And, and, and Abraham's showing them away. Shoe fly, you bother me? And jumping in at verse 12, it says this. As the sun was setting... Abram fell into a deep sleep, and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. Then the Lord said to him, Know for certain that for 400 years your descendants will be strangers in a country not their own, and that they will be enslaved and mistreated there. How many of you can say amen that when God tells you, he'll tell you, he'll tell you straight up. He'll tell you straight up. It ain't going to be easy. It ain't always going to look nice, but here's the picture. Hallelujah. <clears throat> but I will punish the nation they serve as slaves, and afterward they will come out with great possessions. You, however, will go to your ancestors in peace and be buried at a good old age. In the fourth generation, your descendants will come back here, for the sin of the Amorites has not yet reached its full measure. And when the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking fire pot with a blazing torch appeared and passed between those pieces of those animals now the reason I, I, I felt stirred to, to talk about this 
scripture in this part of Abraham's life as we're looking at Abraham and talking about being set apart was because of that, that smoking fire pot and that blazing torch. So, some scholars would say it would be more like there was a burning fire in the midst of heavy smoke. And what that was was a representation of God himself passing between those parts, which was an old way of, of confirming a covenant and making a covenant between two parties, was to pass between that which was been slaughtered and cut in half. And the Lord himself came down and passed between those parts, and he made a covenant with Abram right there that what he said was going to happen was going to happen. But that fire and that smoke represents the holiness of God. It is God, and God is what? Now, God's not fire and God's not smoke, but our God is a consuming fire, amen? And, what, and, and when, when you read that, I, I get the picture of Exodus 19 and 20 when, when, when God is wanting to meet with the Israelites at Mount Sinai, and, and there's... Thunder and lightning and the sound of a great trumpet and smoke on the mountain and, 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 and uh, all this stuff is taking place and then the Lord descends on the mountain in fire and, and all this stuff is happening, right? And the children of Israel are afraid. I would be. You would be. And, but there's something about when, when you can y'all hear me I think my hand moved down <clears throat> don't do that uh, my left hand does not know what my right hand is doing I'll just Here, here's what here's what Moses spoke to the people of Israel in Exodus 20 when the people saw the thunder and lightning and heard the trumpet and saw the mountain and smoke, they trembled with fear. They stayed at a distance and said to Moses, Speak to us yourself and we will listen, but do not have God speak to us or we will die. And Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Now think about this. He says, Do not be afraid. God has come to test you so that the fear of God will be with you to keep you from sinning. Don't be afraid. But the fear of God will be in the midst of you to keep you from sinning. All through Scripture, when, God, when someone catches a glimpse of God, there is a holy and righteous, reverent fear that comes upon them. Abram, before that smoking fire pot, before that blazing torch passed between those parts, verse 12 says that he fell into a deep sleep and a thick and dreadful darkness came over him. What was that? He may not have known it, but it was the fear of the Lord. When God shows up, he's to be reverenced. And as a believer, God's already there in you. And he should be reverenced. And there's those moments when we come together. You ever been in a service where, where there's a lot of worship going on, a lot of prayer going on, and then all of a sudden everything just goes quiet. And then God begins to speak through a gift or, or what have you. I call those those holy hush moments. Because here's the heart's cry of worship and in prayer, but all of a sudden... When God, I don't want to say steps in the room, but I'm going to say it that way just in the sense of because we, we're the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. But there's a more weighty moment that, in, that, in that moment of time that God steps into the room, so to speak, to draw us closer and make himself aware of who he is, not just in what he wants to say, but even in that moment of his holiness and of his power. That's why everything goes quiet in those moments. Is this making sense at all? And 
I saw my hand go down. I had to move it up. Ethan, I'm going to borrow your little army thing there and just lock that thing. Uh, I'm going to start holding it like, you know, like. The holiness of God is nothing to be messed around with. And the holiness of his people is something that shouldn't be messed around with. Something that set Israel apart from all the nations of the earth was that God was with them, right in the midst of them. Whether that was a pillar of cloud by, by day or a pillar of fire by night, or the fact that the Ark of the Covenant was right there in that tabernacle of Moses, God was dwelling in the midst of his people. And God's dwelling in the midst of his people today. So, I'll pull this out because when we talk about set apart, I think there's something that we need to do first and foremost. So, 1 Peter chapter 3, I don't know who's up there, but thank you. Out of the New King James, it says, Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. That's part of that verse, right? Sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks uh, you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. There's meekness and fear. That's not being terrified. That's a reverent fear. But he says, sanctify the Lord God in your heart. What's that mean? That same set apart means consecrate. As much as we've been talking about God, us setting ourselves apart for God, and we know that God has consecrated us to himself. We sang about it earlier, right? We, we, he called us and brought us out of darkness and put us in light. He brought us out of death and put us into life. Hallelujah. He brought us out of the kingdom of this world and brought us into the kingdom of God. God consecrated us, and, he, and we've been talking about consecrating ourselves to the purposes of God. But the reality is unless we're consecrating the Lord God in our hearts, we're going to struggle with that. Because what this, what this verse is saying is, uh, and I'll read it out of the Amplified uh, part of it, that first part, but, if, uh, but in your heart set Christ apart as holy, acknowledging him, giving him first place in your lives as Lord. If we are not going to set that as our heart's goal day in and day out, every moment of the day, to, to recognize and declare in our hearts that God himself, he is holy, the one that whose name we are called is holy, we're going to have a hard time separating ourselves from this world and being committed to Christ like we should be. That's the reality of it. We're going to struggle with that. So as much as we've been looking at Abram's life, Abraham's life, and seeing that God has called him out and we, and we have applied that to our lives, I want us to understand that we got to do what Abram did. And what Abram did was that he set God apart in his own heart and his mind, and there was no one else like God. There was no, there was no other God that could, that could speak the way he spoke. There was no other God to fulfill the promises that he's fulfilled or going to fulfill or made. There's no other God that created the heavens and the earth. Abraham said in his heart that God is God and he's the only one. And because of that, he set his heart to be set apart for the purposes of God. What's changed? Nothing's changed, right? I got another hour. Y'all hold on. The same calling is there. God is still holy. Has God lost his holiness? Has God misplaced his holiness somewhere? Where did I put my holiness? God is holy. Matter of fact, the word holy was, in, was, was created to describe God. When you talk about God's awesome, it's a holy awesome when, awesomeness. When you talk about God's power, it's a holy power. When you talk about God's mercy, it's a holy mercy. That's why the angels cry out, holy, holy, holy. He's thrice holy. Holy Father, Holy Son, Holy Spirit. Amen? Every, every representation of the Godhead is holy, and there is no division in him. There's no part of him that's not holy. And we're called to be holy. 
Nothing has changed. And to be who God has called us to be, there needs to be a, a remembrance and a consecration in our hearts that God is holy. And in that, allow the fear of the Lord to guide us in how we live. Amen? So, landing pad coming at you. You're like, this guy preached short. Don't get used to it. I'm just, <laughs> and it may feel long. I don't know. I'm just, I'm just going with it. The, the scripture that's been on my heart, I'm all kinds of discombobulated here, but that's all right. Another, another verse that really just stood out to me, because we've been talking about a house of prayer for the nations here, right? Haven't we? Is this the first y'all heard about? <laughs> In case y'all didn't know, we're talking about the, uh, the church being a, a house of prayer for the nations. But thinking about this in Mark chapter 11, verses 15 through 18, it says, On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said to them, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers? And the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard the... uh, uh, Excuse me. Uh, other law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him, for they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. And we look at that part and it says, My house shall be called a house of prayer for the nations. Praise God. But you understand that when Jesus walked into that scenario, he wasn't afraid to point out and deal with and turn over what shouldn't have been there. Do you have tables in your life? Do you have stuff sitting on those tables in your life? See, here's what we like to do. Sometimes we come to the Lord. Now, remember, that scripture we talked about earlier says we're not our own. The problem with these, the, 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 these tables and what was happening in the temple was because the, 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 there was a shift. There was a shift away from whose temple it was, and it became about a profit it be, in the sense of making money. It became about convenience. It became about being a place of commerce. It became a place about uh, admiring the, the, the temple building, just like Jesus' own disciples did when they're walking out and they're like, man, look at this. There was a distraction. There was, there was a, an offsetting of what it should have been, where they should have been coming in and being amazed by the God who inhabits that place, whose name is upon that temple, and rejoiced and set their hearts in simple worship there, rather than putting something self-centered in the midst of it. And a lot of times as believers, we, we, we come to Christ and through through times of repentance, we don't let Jesus take the tables out or turn them over. We just ask him to clear them off. And the reality is, and if anybody's ever set up these eight-foot tables around here, you know this. When them tables go down, it's time to move them. It's time to get them out of here. That was the purpose of what Jesus was dealing with when he was turning over those tables. They can't have a place here. If I leave a table here, now I don't know about y'all, but in my house, I don't have my keys. But when I walk in, I know y'all all got a place where junk accumulates. Some of us got three or four places. Mm, and the preacher said, yes, Lord, that's me. And my wife said, yes, Lord, it's him. Uh, <laughs> But if I don't deal with it, I keep on dropping them there. There's my keys, there's my mail, my phone, my work phone case. This ain't my work phone case. You'll see, you, you would know it if you saw it. And all this stuff begins to pile up because why? It's got a place for it to stay. Back in the Old Testament, 
There were times when kings would come in and they would take down idols, but they wouldn't necessarily get rid of the high place. And you go, well, what's the big deal? They got rid of the idol. Well, it still provided a place for that idol to be set back up. And the problem with tables is the, the, re- the reality is it's something that we own. And what's on that table we own, but we're not even our own. It's something of us and what's really his. And it can't happen. I don't know why I'm clearing that off, but I did. God has called us to be holy. Now things in, the, in, that, in that temple being us. That may be the temple, I mean, may be the table, or maybe something sitting on the table might be things like bitterness. I'll just give a few examples. It might be sexual immorality. Might be lust. Might be offense. Might be anger at God. Might be legitimate hurt. That's not your fault but it constantly has a place to stay. Maybe it's just this little word. It's not super little, but it's a big word. Maybe it's control. Because don't you say you surrender all for Jesus when you're holding the reins. Don't talk about Jesus being Lord of your life when your bumper sticker on your heart says Jesus is my co-pilot. Just, just being real here. And you understand I ain't pointing fingers or picking up stones. Because just like I talked about my keys being in my house, I've got tables. And as I've been preparing this message, and really over the last three weeks, it may not seem like it, but yeah, I have. God's been preparing this message in me because sometimes it's a willful setting up, and sometimes it creeps in. But whatever the case is, you got to be willing to lay down your control and say, Lord, I'm your temple. Whatever is in it that doesn't need to be in it, anything that's out of order that needs to be set in order, got anything that's dusty that needs to be shined up, got anything that's of the flesh that needs to be crucified, got anything that's sin that needs to be dealt with and repented over, got whatever is there that's not of you, Lord, it needs to come out of me, be out of me, get out of me, stay out of me, and, 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 and if it comes back, then repeat as necessary. Being a bald guy, y'all didn't think I'd know a shampoo reference, did you? (laughs) But the reality is, is God has called us to holiness. God has called us to be set apart. God has called us to bear his image and his presence in this lost, hurt, dying world. And it may not be up on the ark of a covenant, so to speak, with poles that we're bearing it, and we're not may not be Levites, so to speak, after the tribes of Israel, but we are a holy nation and a royal priesthood, and we are called in this dark, dark, dark age that we live in that we can bear the presence of the living God with hope and with obedience and with holiness so that God can see God for who he truly is, and not just the image that we've made him. And God has called us to that place. So talking about God wanting to do something new, something fresh, revivalistic, so to speak. Things that kill a move of God are those tables and the things that set up on them. Because once our control or our flesh or sin gets comfortable in our lives, and we're not allowing God to deal with them, there's a problem. And I'm convinced 
in the body of Christ. I don't know all you guys. I don't know you very well. I've only been here a year and a half, not even that. But generally speaking, especially in America, there's a lot of unchecked mess in our hearts, in our lives. Some of us will come and praise the Lord on Sunday and cheat on our taxes on Wednesday. I do not represent the IRS. And we all know they need to be sanctified. <laughs> and if you're here and you work for the IRS, please quit squeezing us. Uh, no, <laughs> But God calls us to be holy through and through. That's why Paul writes in Philippians chapter 2, he says, uh, jumping to the last part of that, he says, and continue to work out your salvation through fear and trembling. What that scripture means, it doesn't mean, well, I'm convicted by this, but you're not. You know, it's dealing with the change and the transformation that Jesus did in your heart working outwardly to every aspect of your life. That's what that working out of your salvation is. What God did in your heart, it works out to your speech. It works out to your your attitude. It works out to your actions. It works out to your prayer life. It works out to your relationship with your parents. It works out to your relationship with your spouse. It works out to your relationship with your kids, with your friends, in the church house, so forth and so on. But that's to happen in fear and trembling with a holy reverence of who God is. Because if we lose sight of that, then it goes haywire. We start comparing. We start this and that. But when our eyes are fixed upon the Lord and we've set Him apart and there's a holy fear of God in us, of a holy God, knowing that only by His grace... (laughs) Only by His grace we achieve anything for the glory of the Lord. There's a holding fast to Him which causes us to let go of all the other mess because He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of your praise. He's worthy of your prayer. He's worthy of your time. He's worthy of your mess. He's worthy of your failures. He's worthy of your successes. He's worthy of your life. Matter of fact, he's even worthy of your death if you have to die for him. He's worthy of it all. All. Not some, not most, not 99.9%. All. If you are born again, you're to the temple of the Holy Spirit, and, it, 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 and it's his temple. Not yours. Not somebody else's house with your furniture in it. Because the minute somebody buys a house, that furniture is theirs. Jesus bought the house. Hallelujah. And he's able to distribute it and get rid of whatever needs to be get rid of if we'll allow him. Talk about the seven churches in Revelation. And it's the last thing I'll say. Worship team, come on up. I guess I lied because I said that, and I'll say a few more things, but it really wasn't a lie. Relax, okay? <laughs> Think about this. When Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, he was talking to a church. He wasn't just talking to a sinner though it might apply. But he was talking about a church. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll hear it, if you'll open, I'll come in. But when I come in, yes, there'll be fellowship and there'll be eating and drinking, but there will be a house set in order. There'll be a house set in order. You don't think that... That's the truth, and what did Jesus say about when an unclean spirit comes out of a man? 
and says when it comes back to whence it came, he finds the house swept and put in order. It's because when Jesus comes in, you relinquish your control. When Jesus comes in, he sets all things in order. He cleanses the house. He sweeps the floor. Because he wants to make you holy. So I'm just going to ask you not to think about your neighbor. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you to think about your family members this message might apply to. I want you to think about you. Not in a selfish way, making it about you, and yet dealing with you. Maybe there's some tables in your life that you've set up or have allowed to be set up. And maybe you've got clutter on that table. Maybe you've got a mess in the temple of the Holy Spirit. And you just need to come to a, a fresh place of full surrender. Of repentance. Of asking God and giving God the access to set His house in order the way He seems fit. And I love that word surrender. I always told my kids, no one halfway surrenders. When that white flag is, is waving, either you're fully surrendered or you're not. So as the Holy Spirit is searching us, and I know that He is, and you didn't get an eloquent man giving an eloquent speech, but I know the Spirit of God has given this message for us today, and I say us, not you, because it's for me as well. So I'm going to invite you, if there are tables, if there are hurts that keep constantly finding places to rest, if there's offense, if there's bitterness, if there's sin, I ain't asking you to come tell me you mail. I'm asking you to come and deal with it in your heart, whether it's in your seat or whether a place of prayer at an altar or wherever it is, but do not let it go unchecked. If Jesus is truly worthy of it all, then give him access to it all. Give him all of it. And what he wants to do with it from there is up to him. But give it all to him. So I invite you to come as the worship team sings.